Hi guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we've got Ernest Chan doing a presentation on uh, capital allocation and risk management, a large portion of which will be focused on the Kelly formula. I would consider this an advanced topic webinar, so you've been forewarned. <laughs> Uh, Ernie's a managing member of QTS Capital Management, and he's worked for various investment banks and hedge funds over the years, uh, almost 15 years in fact. He has a PhD in physics from Cornell University and was a member of IBM's Human Language Technologies Group uh, before he uh, joined the financial industry. Uh, he's also the author of Quantitative Trading. And uh, I, I don't have the book myself, but the reviews on Amazon are very good. And I have heard that uh, if you have or use MATLAB in particular, there's a lot of, of excellent sample code in the book for MATLAB. Uh, so today I'll be turning things over to Ernie in just a minute, but we're going to be giving away five autographed copies of his book, Quantitative Trading. And uh, it's very important that you pay attention to the webinar so that you have a chance to win one of those books. Uh, as we go through the presentation, he's going to be asking some quiz questions. Uh, the first person to answer the quiz question will be the winner of the book. You can win one book today, and we're going to give away a total of five. And in order for me to get in touch with you to get the book in your hands, I will be asking the winners for their BMT username. So if you came to this webinar through some other means other than uh, Big Mike Trading, sorry, other than Big Mike Trading, then you need to go to uh, the website BigMikeTrading.com and register a username. It's free. It takes less than a minute. That way, if you are one of the winners, uh, you can give me your BMT username, and then I'll get in touch with you after the webinar in order to get the books or the book in your hands. All right, guys, uh, give me just a minute, and I'll be turning things over to Ernie. As you guys have questions, type them into the, uh, the box there and I'll do my best to get everyone's questions answered today, uh, or Ernie will at least. <laughs> All right, guys, hang on one second. Here comes Ernie. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, uh, for your introduction. Um, let me make sure that uh, is everybody able to uh, see my presentation on my screen? Yes, we can hear you, and I can see it just fine. Thanks, Ernie. That, that's great. Uh, thank you very much for coming, guys. Uh, and um, so uh, let me just uh, start right off uh, by telling you what exactly is Kelly formula. It's three things at once. It's quite a wonderful uh, formula. Uh, the first um, use of Kelly formula is risk management. Uh, the theory, and I emphasize theory, is that if you uh, adopt uh, the Kelly formula, you will reduce or even eliminate the possibility of losing all of your account equity due to cumulative trading losses. Now, I emphasize theory because there is an assumption uh, in, Kelly, uh, in this implementation of the Kelly formula, and which is that the uh, stock returns or whatever instrument returns are Gaussian. We will talk a little bit more about that uh, in the future. But if stock prices and stock returns are uh, well behaved, as in a, a Gaussian distribution, then Kelly formula tells you that uh, by adopting this method, you will not uh, go to zero equity. Now, uh, of course, we don't want ever to even lose a substantial chunk of money, not to mention lose it all, and I will tell you a little bit uh, a, a additional scheme where you can apply for, uh, which when combined with Kelly formula, you can control the maximum drawdown uh, and not to let it go to any arbitrary number uh, you designate. The second uh, uh, use of Kelly formula is leverage optimization. And that is, you know, oftentimes we are uh, faced with a, a good trading strategy, but we are uh, stuck with the problem of, you know, what uh, proper leverage uh, should we apply. Uh, is it going to be uh, is one or is it two? You know, uh, Kelly formula tells you a very um, uh, a formulaic way of computing the proper leverage. And what this proper or optimal leverage implies is that uh, if you adopt this leverage, you will be able to generate maximum compounded growth of your portfolio equity. 
So this is uh, the best you can do. In other words, if you adopt that leverage, not only will you uh, not have the risk of losing all your equity, but you will maximize the potential uh, compounded growth of that strategy. And then finally, the third uh, use of Kelly formula is optimal capital allocation. That is, if you have multiple strategies, uh, Kelly formula will tell you what is the relative leverage between these strategies or between these portfolios. So there is, it gives you the optimal overall leverage, but it also gives you the uh, relative, optimal relative leverage amongst the different strategies in order to uh, create a maximum uh, growth of that portfolio. So, uh, and by the way, uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions as I go along because the, some of these uh, concepts can be uh, rather difficult. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's better if we go along and understand every one of them. Hey, Ernie, uh, uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned that I'm not a, a math major, so I, I'm probably going to make some or ask some embarrassing questions. But you're talking about leverage here. I want to first understand. Um, you know, futures, for example, are already a highly leveraged instrument. So, do we do we ever use like the margin requirements as part of factoring the Kelly formula leverage? How do, how does that work together? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the case of uh, uh, futures, uh, we define leverage as your uh, the market value of your position, so the notional amount uh, divided by the actual account equity. And that actually applies to you know whether you're doing futures or stock. It's always uh, the the gross market value divided by the account equity. So if you're um, uh, you know you're you're, you're trading uh, a future that uh, you know the notional amount is a uh, hundred thousand dollars, even though you are required to have a, a margin um, amount of uh, maybe uh, you know ten thousand uh, dollars. You know, if you have ten thousand dollars in the account and you're trading this one contract which has a, a notional value of a hundred thousand dollars, the leverage will be ten. And however, Kelly formula gotcha. might tell you that uh, yes, if but Kelly formula might tell you that it's not a good idea to to use this minimal margin amount in your account. It may ask you to actually put uh, deposit. Uh, uh, Twenty thousand dollars instead of just having ten thousand dollars in account, just uh, for safety sake. Otherwise, you know, Kelly Formula might tell you that you quite could well lose all the ten thousand dollars equity, and and you know, right. we'd be done. Right. Uh, George asked the question, uh, and hoping that we're not going to interrupt you too much here, but we're going to try to get the questions uh, as they come in. Uh, Kelly Formula is developed with the assumption of a random market with a Gaussian distribution. Do you think that that assumption holds? That is a, uh, a very good question, and that is the main caveat uh, uh, on Kelly formula. Uh, yes, it does assume Gaussian uh, distribution of returns, and we all know that the actual financial prices are not Gaussian. You know, o occasionally we are surprised by how much the market gets dropped in a day. For example, in 1987, I think it dropped 20 or 21 percent in a day. Right, uh, right after. Uh, September 11, uh, you know, I, you know, then we we had a three-day market close, and then it dropped. Uh, you know, I, right. I can't remember. Well, north of 10 percent. Right, and Jason makes right. that point. He's saying, uh, as a misrepresentation of ketosis distributions was a cause for poor risk management prior to 2008. Has anyone adapted this formula or other distributions such as mixed Gaussian or student T, etc.? Yes, uh, well, that's a little bit complicated, but uh, let me uh, first answer the first uh, question uh, properly first. Um, the, the, the issue, however, is that, um, you know, uh, you can uh, have a much more sophisticated way of um, applying Kelly formula uh, without assuming the Gaussian uh, assumption, uh, you know, without the, uh, the Gaussian distribution. You know, actually, the fundamental um, gist of uh, Kelly formula is independent of Gaussian distribution. However, there is no analytical solution uh, to a simple leverage formula if you, don't, if you don't assume a Gaussian distribution. So what I have done, and actually this is some stuff that I, will, uh, I have written in my new book that is coming out, you know, a little page six months from now, you will see that um, you can Get, uh, get rid of the Gaussian distribution and just uh, adopt a, let's say, Monte Carlo distribution, uh, Monte Carlo uh, sampling of some kind of distribution with kurtosis or with whatever uh, strange distribution that you like. 
and then uh, find the optimal leverage based on this kind of um, sort of brute force method or Monte Carlo method. What I found, however, is interestingly um, that uh, the two methods, whether you assume Gaussian distribution or not, actually give you a very similar uh, leverage estimate. Uh, so, you know, despite all this caveat about, uh, you know, non-Gaussian distribution, it turns out that the, the estimate for leverage is fairly robust. It seldom uh, overestimate the leverage so much that even, you know, in the face of a non-Gaussian distribution, it will actually uh, lead you to ruin. So, I think right. that is one of the beauty of, uh, uh, you know, credit form. All right. Uh, one final question for now, and then we'll move on. Uh, Mr. Pelt says, he's often wondered, uh, take a trading strategy or a methodology, can money management or risk allocation turn a trading methodology that overall on balance is losing money into something that is profitable? And by that he means imagine that the strategy is trading one contract, for example, on futures, and it's losing money uh, over time. Can various money management schemes turn that into a profitable question or into a profitable strategy? Uh, the answer is no. Um, you know, in Kelly formula, I will show you a very simple, uh, uh, you know, form of the Kelly formula. Actually, the next page uh, gives you that. It is uh, simply equal to the the average return divided by the variance of return. So, if your average return is negative, you know, by by that you mean a losing strategy. Uh, you know, the the leverage will be negative. So that means that you sh you know you should be trading up the opposite of that strategy. So. Right. Uh, you know, that's, that's a simple way of saying that there's so, no way to turn right. an uncomfortable strategy. Ke yeah, Kelly, Kelly is simply about the, the risk management. It's not telling you where to set your target or, or your stop. It's just telling you how much to bet, right? That, that is right, yeah. That is right. So, um, you know, moving on to this uh, simple formula, you know, if you have one portfolio or just one strategy, uh, and you have an a average access return of M. Now, access return means that the uh, the return of the strategy, uh, the unlevered return of the strategy minus the risk fee rate. Okay, so financial uh, researchers always like this access return notion. Uh, and if you have the standard deviation of this access returns is S, then the optimal leverage, uh, which again is defined as the gross market value divided by the account equity. Uh, is simply uh, m divided by s squared. Now notice that this looks very similar to what people call the sharp ratio. The sharp ratio is m divided by s, but here we are m divided by s squared. Uh, and the one thing to to be uh, you know be very careful is that this m uh, has to be the unlevered return. So uh, as Mike uh, alluded to earlier, if you have a future contract, the unlevered return must be the notional. Uh, market value, the gross market value divided, uh, uh, what the P and L divided by the uh, the gross uh, market value or the notion of value of the contract. Okay, so it, it is not the not the P and L divided by your account equity. That would be the leverage return. Okay, so this is a fair, you know simple enough. This formula, you know, and anybody can compute that. Uh, you don't need a computer. Uh, but actually, the most important point uh, that Kelly formula makes is that you have to keep your leverage constant at this uh, this value. You know, no matter what value it gives you, you know, you may uh, be able to estimate a better optimal leverage by using Monte Carlo simulation, or you can use uh, some fancy analytical formula with uh, a, a kurtosis assumption. Whatever you use, maybe it's more complicated than this formula that I presented to you, but the the main idea is that once you computed that optimal value, you have to keep your leverage constant. And this sounds simple, but in practice, it can be quite counterintuitive. And I will show you why in the next example. So let's say we have 100 grand in our brokerage account. And, uh, and through some method, or you know, using my simple formula, or using some other complicated ways, you have computed the Kelly leverage, the optimal Kelly leverage, to be 5. So what that means is that you should be trading a portfolio with market value of $500,000. Okay. Now, let's suppose in one day, you know, next day, you, tra you start trading uh, and you lost $10,000. Okay. At the end of the day, you find that you, you have lost $10,000. So naturally, your equity is reduced to $90,000. And uh, Correspondingly, your portfolio market value is now four hundred ninety thousand dollars. Okay, so what 
the constant leverage requirement of California tells you is that you have to liquidate a further $40,000 of your portfolio. Now that is the somewhat counterintuitive point because a, a lot of people think that, well, I already lost money. Why should I liquidate my portfolio further? You know, I should be sort of taking, um, you know, buying on a dip, so to speak. But that is not sound risk management. Risk management tells you that if you, if you are levered and you have lost money, you need to liquidate further uh, uh, your positions in order to protect your equity. So what that means is that, um, you know, if you have to liquid, so based on this uh, five times leverage, you have to liquidate $40,000 of your portfolio so that its updated market value is five times your new equity value of $90,000. So the new um, target portfolio market value is $450,000. Remember, if you don't liquidate this $40,000 uh, worth of portfolio, your market value will remain at $490,000 and that would be over leveraged. You know, Kelly Formula advised you not to over lever. You, you have to sell $40,000 of your portfolio in order to keep your leverage constant. So um, let, let me pause for a moment and see if there are any questions. Well, uh, let's see if anyone has question on this example because this is uh, kind of important uh, and it might be confusing. So let me know if uh, anyone has, uh, has, uh, is confused about this procedure. No? Okay. So, uh, moving on. Uh, so, this example trade, the fact that Kelly Formula always asks to reduce capital at risk, or in another word for portfolio market value, when you incur a loss. Okay? And, and that is assuming, by the way, that's assuming that you are levered at uh, greater than one. If you are unlevered or you are under levered, then, uh, you know, you won't have to do this. Uh, uh, reduction of your market value. Okay, so if, if the optimal Kelly uh, leverage is one or less than one, you wouldn't, it wouldn't ask you to sell. But on the other hand, if it asks you to, if, if your optimal Kelly uh, leverage is greater than one, then yes, you will always be asked to sell into a loss. Right. And if you do this uh, type of risk management, there will be, Kelly promise you that there will be a vanishing probability that you lose all your equity. So there's, there's a few questions. Uh, let me try to catch up here. Um, okay. One question is, can you give a real life example as to what would be the calculation in a portfolio that trades one contract each of uh, oil, silver, gold, and the, and the yen? I think this is too much for you to do right now. Um, but is there, uh, is there maybe like an Excel spreadsheet or something out there or maybe something on your website? that people can plug in numbers and, and find out the answer to that question. Like this gentleman wants to know uh, what his optimal F would be on a portfolio trading four different futures contracts. Okay. Uh, actually, it's very easy. Uh, you, you just need to look at this formula. Uh, you know, no matter how many futures contract you trade, you have to ask yourself, what is the average return? Let's say annualized. You know, it doesn't matter if you are annualized return or daily return. This, this Kelly formula is sort of uh, invariant with respect to time, time scale. So you can use annualized return. So if, you're annualized, if the annualized return of that uh, trading strategy is uh, you know, 20%, just put 0.2 in place of M. And you also need to ask what is the variance of the return of that portfolio. Okay? And it might well be 20% again. Okay, so then in that case you put 0.1 in place of S. So the, f the leverage will be 0.2 divided by 0.2 squared. And the, the notional That's value has exactly. to be, we have to take all four futures contracts notional value. Where does that come into play? That is right. Uh, when you compute the 20% the return, that 20% return it's is based uh, on the, the, the notional value uh, by the account equity, right? That, uh, not the account equity. No, the the uh, the, un, the M, you know, that 20% is the unlevered return. So it will be whatever P&L you get in dollars divided by the gross market value of all four contracts. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. I'm a little slow with this. Hopefully, others are following it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
All right. Uh, is there any other question on this? Uh, uh, I think we could go ahead and move on, and I'll ask questions later. Okay. Uh, all right. So the reason, as I emphasized, that we have to do this sort of uh, uh, rebalancing or selling into a loss is uh, to protect your equity so that it's, uh, uh, there's a vanishing probability that you will lose all your equity. And also, at the same time, uh, this optimal leverage uh, is going to maximize your long-term growth. Now, what does that mean? Well, actually, there's a very simple proof for that. Um, if you are uh, you know, patient with a little bit of mathematics, I can show you this, you know, basically one line of proof. And the reason is that if you are assuming a Gaussian uh, distribution of returns, and if these returns are levered at F, okay, with an unlevered mean and standard deviation of M and S, the formula for this compounded growth rate of a portfolio is simply G equals to the leverage F times M minus S squared F squared divided by 2. So trust me, this is the formula. I, I won't uh, you know, derive this formula for you, but this is the formula for the compounded growth rate of a uh, return series that are, that are, uh, that are uh, you know, of course, randomly distributed, but it has a Gaussian random distribution, and it has a mean of M, and it has standard deviation of S. And if this random return series has these two characteristics, mean M and standard deviation S, then the compounded growth rate is going to be given as G of F as displayed. And if you have this formula, then it is very easy to say, well, then what is the maxima? You know, what, what, what kind of leverage F will maximize this compounded growth rate? And, you know, based on first year calculus, you take the derivative of this formula uh, with respect to f, and you find that the maximum occurs at f equals m uh, divided by s. Ah, now I find the typo. Let me <laughs> easily correct this typo. I need to have a <laughs> I need to have a uh, square there. Well, and it won't go up, but anyway. <laughs> there's a there's a couple of questions to uh, regarding the prior slide about rebalancing. So both mm -hmm. JP okay. and Lucia ask. Um, you know, let's let's say that they're trading primarily an intraday strategy, so they're flat at the end of the day. They're not swing okay. trading. They're not carrying over. Uh, sure. How often should they be rebalancing? Lucia says, at what frequency do you recommend rebalancing your portfolio to keep your leveraged optimal? Even at minute level frequencies, he finds that the transaction costs erode the return, and it's one of the things that Shannon's original arguments uh, were made against the Kelly criterion. So you have to take into account commissions. Uh, possibly slippage as well, you know, uh, is there, is there, uh, is this just something that you just run the numbers or do you have a recommendation on how often you should be re rebalancing the position? Well, it depends very much on the, uh, you know, this is a uh, really a practical question and it's, I find it depends very much on the level of leverage. If your leverage is not high, let's say your leverage is only three, uh, the, the change in the in the day-to-day -day, the rebalancing is going to be small. So even if you're going to rebalance every minute, it, there's not too much stock to sell. So, you know, I, I don't feel that uh, it, it has any big benefit. There's it it wouldn't be practical. Change. Right. Right. It's, it's too minimal. Now, of course, if you are levered at uh, 50, uh, as some Forex trader might do, uh, then, you know, the minute-to-minute minute P&L might affect your equity substantially. And you do need to rebalance, you know, quite often in order to reduce the risk. So, uh, you know, the frequency of rebalancing has to has something to do with the, the, the leverage that you are deploying. And for me personally, I, I nowadays I seldom trade anything uh, with a higher than five times leverage, uh, and I feel very comfortable just rebalancing at the end of the day. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Moving on, uh, here is the first quiz question. Okay, uh, now remember the previous example. We had uh, a portfolio uh, where we started out with a hundred thousand uh, dollars equity, and the portfolio market value is five hundred thousand dollars. That five hundred thousand dollars might be the notional value of the futures contract, you know, uh, added together. Uh, and we, I said that we lost ten thousand dollars in one day, 
so the market value of the equity which was reduced to 90,000 and the portfolio market value was reduced to 490 but after carefully rebalancing we reduced the portfolio market value to $450,000 okay so that was what happened at the end of the previous day after rebalancing now suppose you make $20,000 the next day okay and what should your portfolio market value be you know, what size okay trade so we have we have answers coming in. I'm going to just read them out, and uh, Ernie, just tell me the first one that's right. Uh, Greg says 600. Thomas says 550. That's right. Which, 550 is, okay. is right. So congratulations, okay. Thomas. I need uh, just type in your BMT username, please, and I'll get in touch with you after the webinar to uh, get that book in your hands. Okay. Uh, let me uh, explain why 550 is right. And that is because you know right you know you started with an equity of ninety thousand. Now you made twenty thousand dollars, so the new equity is one hundred and ten thousand dollars. With a optimal leverage of five times, the uh, gross the the optimal market value would be five times one hundred and ten, so that would be five hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. In other words, uh, you have to buy an extra eighty thousand dollars worth of securities in the portfolio. So. A carry formula doesn't always ask you to sell into a loss, but if you make money, they will ask you to borrow money and buy more stocks. Okay, so that is the opposite of what happened in the, in the uh, first example. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, actually before I go on, is, is there any uh, question about why uh, or confusion about why it should be $550,000? Sure. And, and let me also clarify, I see a couple of questions. So we're giving away five autographed copies today of Ernie's book, Quantitative Trading. So that's what corresponds to each quiz question. Uh, so Thomas, uh, if you want that book, then I still need your BMT username. Okay, <laughs> there we go. All right, are there any questions on this slide, guys? Uh, Kevin says, wouldn't it be more risky by buying more shares after the 20,000 increase? Uh, well, no, the, the, the answer is no, because, um, well, you know, remember, Kennedy Formula doesn't just want to decrease risk. But, you know, if it's only a matter of decreasing risk, we should be, you know, all unlevered and, you know, trade at one minimal risk or maybe even underlevered. Right. But at the same time, Kennedy wants you to achieve maximum growth rate of your equity. So you have to maintain a constant leverage, uh, to and you know if you maintain constant leverage, you have achieved the optimal balance between growth right. and risk. Right. Gotcha. Uh, George is asking, how do you determine the leverage of options strategies when the delta neutral approach, such as butterflies, or with a delta neutral approach, like butterflies or back spreads? Uh, this, you know, formalism. This kind of formula, it, it, it doesn't really care what. Uh, you know, instrument, what underlying instrument you trade. So if you are trading options, you, the only question we have to ask is, what is the, the market value? Okay, so the market value, you know, if you are, for example, uh, long options, uh, you might consider it just the, uh, uh, just the premium of the options itself and divide it by whatever account equity you have. Uh, on the other hand, if you are short options, you can consider the, uh, the market value uh, of you know, the risk of your portfolio, okay? So uh, the crucial question is not the details of your portfolio, but exactly how you're going to calculate an unlevered return. So that that depends on how you think is the unlevered return is in the case of a complex option strategy, you know. Right, uh, okay. That's, okay, so let me continue on to the the next slide, and that is a uh, sometimes a, a confusion that a lot of traders have, and that's the dif distinction between continuous and discrete carry. A lot of traders are very familiar familiar with the notion of carry formula, but they are familiar with the discrete version. That is to say, uh, it is almost like in a uh, game of gamble rather than trading. Uh, we make bets that have two discrete outcomes: are you winning or are you losing? Now, if you win, you win. You know. Let's say one dollar. If you lose, you could have lose everything that you have. That is a sort of a, uh, a discrete uh, batting, and there is a carry formula for that. But that is not 
particularly useful for finance uh, because um, if you are really involved in gambling, making bets rather than uh, trading, you know, there is always the possibility in one bet losing uh, all of your equity. And in that case, you should always bet less than your total equity. So in that case, the leverage must always be less than one because if your leverage is, uh, is one, you know, it's, you either win all or lose all. And that's not good. We, the credit formula wants you to preserve your capital so that you can always um, win back uh, you know, in the next time. So that's why a lot of times traders find that, well, you know, how can I um, bet more than what I have, you know, in finance? Why, why, why if, you know, if I have $10,000, why should I leverage it to trade a $20,000 portfolio? Whereas, you know, oftentimes people say, California said you should only bet, you know, 80% of your equity or 60%. But that's what, that's because in the case of uh, making discrete bets or in gambling, uh, you have the chance of making one bet and lose it all. But that is never going to happen in finance or seldom going to happen in finance. Uh, you know, they, the stock is unli un unlikely to drop to zero, uh, you know, in one day unless it goes bankrupt. So there are some extreme cases, but if you have a, uh, a you know, Gaussian return, again, you're assuming Gaussian return and you have a, a diversified portfolio, uh, you might lose. 10%, 20%, or maybe even 30% in one day, you know, in some extreme circumstance, but it's not going to lose 100%. And in that situation, uh, we are going to apply the formula that I talk about, which is applicable to continuous outcome. Uh, and in that case, you can bet more than your equity. You can leverage it uh, greater than one. If you have $110,000, you should be able to bet more than $10,000. So that's the uh, sort of the difference between the way I'm uh, using carry formula and a lot of times uh, when uh, other people were discussing carry formula in the discrete batting case. Uh, so let me pause again for a moment to see if any uh, question about this distinction. Uh, there's, there's not any questions, I don't think. Actually, hang on, one just came in. Um, how does Kelly come into play if you have multiple strategies and the strategies share some correlation between them? For example, a momentum strategy. I think maybe he's talking about like, you know, different strategies on the same instruments or in the futures world, you know, maybe if you're trading index futures, you know, they're pretty highly correlated. Do you factor in correlation with the portfolio in any of this? Yes, we definitely have to factor in correlation and that is actually forming the last part of this uh, presentation. I will talk about capital allocation and that uh, it's going to require a more complicated form of Kelly formula that incorporates the, uh, the covariance between the different strategies. So okay. I will come to that in a few slides. Okay, great. All right, that's it. There's no, no other questions right now. Okay, so now uh, in practice, a lot of uh, traders would use what is called a half Kelly. So if you, know, you use this uh, F equals M divided by S squared formula and you come up with, uh, you know, let's say, five times leverage, many traders would say, let's just use 2.5. You know, divide this uh, Kelly leverage by two. And the reason is that you know, the return and the variance of returns are all estimates. You have a finite amount of data, uh, it tends to change. Uh, you know, you, your, your estimate cannot be very accurate, you know, maybe based on one year data, maybe three years data, but it's not going to be accurate. So there's this uncertainty in the estimate, and so it's safer to be on the under leverage side than to be on the over leverage side, and that's one reason. The other reason is that, you know, whatever estimate you get, you know, no matter how long a historical data you have that you use to estimate the M and the S in calculating F, the future return and the future variance of return may not be the same. So that is one problem with finance is that the past doesn't always um, predict the portents the future. The future return may not be the same as the past return. So again, to be on the safe side, we always divide uh, the leverage, the optimal leverage recommended by Kelly by two when we are applying to a practical strategy to avoid over leveraging. And the reason is, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of uh, analytical work done in, on Kelly formula which says that if you are over leveraging, you know, if your leverage is actually higher than the optimal for the future return and the future standard deviation, you might go 
to go to uh, ruin. You know, your your equity might actually go to zero. But if you are under leverage, uh, it will never go to zero. It might not uh, maximize the growth rate. It might not uh, have as high growth rate as you like. But at least uh, it would not go to uh, ruin. So it is always safer to be on the under leverage side than on the over leverage side. And you're you're mentioning ruin, Ernie. You might remember a few months ago, whenever we first set up this event. Uh, I sent you a thread on uh, the risk of ruin, and some of the guys in the forum did a lot of work, uh, you know, basically using trade expectancy, you know, taking both the stop and the target into account, and uh, I think it was half Kelly trying to come up with a formula to uh, compute like a risk of ruin. So, you know, Kelly's for bet sizing. Um, you mentioned that you have another book coming out. I'm wondering, do you have an opinion? Uh, on a preferred method to that takes into account, you know, a, a stop placement, like how mu how much uh, equity is actually being risked on that particular trade based on where your stop is, and also takes into account the target, uh, you know, how much your potential reward is on that trade. Well, um, it's not going to be Kelly, but do you, I'm just wondering uh, if you have a preferred method for that. Actually, uh, you know, that falls, you know, you could say that that falls under the heading of parameter optimization because, you know, the stop loss and the profit cap, these are two uh, parameters, right? So for every strategy, you could say, well, let me uh, implement the stop loss and let me implement the profit cap. And, uh, you know, you can use historical data to optimize these two numbers. But the problem, there are two problems with this. Well, the first problem is that uh, for mean referring strategy, it, it's seldom optimal to have a stop loss. I have never seen a stop loss uh, you know, generating an optimal, uh, you know, uh, uh, for being being the op a, a non-zero stop loss being the optimal value for a mean referring, mean referring strategy. On the other hand, um, for a momentum strategy, it's seldom optimal to have a profit cap. Gotcha. Uh, and and so that's. A, in general, a problem. Right. The second problem is also that whenever you're trying to do parameter optimization, the past seldom predicts the future. Uh, and uh, you know, so you, you, you might think that there's a uh, you know, precise value of stop loss that worked very well in the past. And you know, it's easy to, to optimize this kind of value for the past. But the problem is that it's seldom uh, true in the future. Uh, unlike Kelly formula, where the past uh, oftentimes is, is a little bit more robust, where you don't have to estimate it completely accurately uh, in order to get close to the optimal growth rate. So Kelly formula is, has this virtue of being a little bit robust with respect to uh, errors in the estimation, whereas the precise value of stop loss and profit cap uh, are, are you know, very sensitive to the data that you use. So uh, just so I can better understand what you're doing, you, you mentioned that you're primarily trading stocks. Are you uh, an intraday trader or do you swing trade? Do you hold positions for many months at a time? Well, I uh, was a primary stock trader until 2010. Okay. So at that time, um, I do trade in, in intraday. I, I seldom hold stock positions overnight. Okay, so if you have a, a basket of stocks, you know, let's say there's 10 stocks that you're trading and you decided that you want to be long, you know, half of them and short the other half, um, were, were, you, uh, were you rebalancing that position during the day? I mean, were, were you constantly, as it went against you, you know, if you're long and it's dropping, were you taking off shares and then as it went with you, were you adding shares back? Is that something that you did throughout the day? No, no. Um, only at the end of the day. Yes, only at the end of the day, and because I do, you you have a choice of using Kelly formula to run every stock separately, like, like as a capital allocation uh, formula. You can do that, but there is, and you know, there are two ways to look at it. Because sometimes you have a trading strategy, you know, a long short strategy, that de determines, you know, what the capital allocation is regardless of what Kelly formula you know. Because Kelly formula is kind of dumb, you know, it only knows the correlation between the stock returns and the, and the standard deviation and the, return, uh, and the mean. But if your strategy, uh, po po uh, you know, pretends that it knows more about 
the characteristic of these stocks than the simple Gaussian um, assumptions, then it can make a better capital allocation. In that case, you can still use Keller formula to determine the overall leverage of the portfolio. You don't have to use it to determine the individual allocation among the different stocks. Gotcha. We're clear. I see a question coming in. If you have 30 instruments in a strategy, do you apply the Kelly formula to each instrument uh, or do you apply it to the entire portfolio and then take the mean return and the standard deviation of all instruments for the calculations? Yes, actually that's the uh, uh, the question. It's pretty much the same answer as I just uh, mentioned. Uh, usually, uh, if you're, you have a strategy for uh, you, you know, usually if you have back-tested a strategy assuming certain capital allocation among the different stocks, let's say equal capital allocation or some other fancy allocation that your strategy determined, then you should follow that allocation. You should not apply Kelly to uh, determine the individual stock allocation because Kelly is kind of dumb, like I said. Uh, it doesn't know very much about these stocks except its uh, historical covariance. Uh, but you should just use Kelly to determine the overall leverage of the portfolio. So you would scale gotcha. all the stocks by the same factor uh, as, as you experience with returns. So uh, one final question, then we can move on. Uh, Lucia asks, for strategies that deliver double-digit sharp ratios in production uh, sampled daily after transaction costs, uh, my experience is that you always hit a hard cap in capacity before you can apply up to Kelly leverage. Uh, what would you do in this case? What methods would you use to estimate a strategy's capacity, like, for example, the maximum number of contracts per trade or the maximum capital to allocate in a strategy? Yes, uh, that's actually I have, uh, you know, run into myself, uh, you know, and it's not just, a, you know, cap capacity um, a limitation is one reason why we would hit a limit on the leverage, but there's another limit which is most often uh, in this case of stocks is that your broker we won't allow you to run the leverage as high as what Kelly recommends. Right? So uh, sometimes the Kelly uh, leverage might say that you should apply 10 times leverage to your equity portfolio, uh, but your broker just refuses. Uh, they say that you can only apply up to you know six times, and in that case, you know unfortunately. Sometimes it is better just to put all your eggs into one basket. That is to say, uh, if you know, assuming that uh, you, you're using Kali to allocate capital between two different strategies, and um, it says that okay, you should uh, allocate five times leverage on strategy A and six times leverage on strategy B. Okay, so the total leverage is eleven times because you have five on A and five six on B, but your broker says that you can only use up to six times leverage. Do you reduce both of them, A and B, by the same amount so that you could still fit within this uh, six times leverage maximum? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, if you want to achieve maximum growth rate, you should just drop the strategy A and just trade strategy B. So you should only pick the strategy that has the highest return. if. You are, if you have a constraint on the maximum leverage you can deploy, either because of the brokerage limitation or because of capacity limitation. Okay, great. So let's move on, and then I'll, I'll hold a couple of questions until uh, the next slide or two. Okay, great. Um, the other point about uh, uh, the practical implementation of Kelly, you know, besides you know taking the half Kelly instead of using half Kelly, is that uh, a lot of times we are not only concerned about maximum return, but we are also concerned about uh, controlling drawdown. And remember, the only thing Pali promise you is that the drawdown won't be 100%, okay? But it could be 90%. You might experience a 90% drawdown, and then the strategy, you know, rebound up to a you know, glorious future. That might happen, but um, you know, it could be uh, one scary ride. So, um, what can we do? You know, in, in the practical agreement implementation, what can we do to also limit drawdown while, uh, while we uh, uh, take advantage of this uh, uh, you know, maximum growth rate that Kelly uh, promises? Well, there is a method, uh, a long version of the explanation you can find on my blog. You, know, uh, you can you know, go to my blog and s search for Kelly formula. And also, in particular, you can search for this uh, keyword, constant proportion portfolio insurance. CPPI. That is a method where you can 
apply Kelly formula and be assured that the drawdown will not exceed any number you uh, preset. And I will explain it in the next slide. So CPPI uh, asks you to divide your equity into a safe account and a risky account. The allocation to the risky account is based on your maximum drawdown allowed. So, for example, if you have one dollar equity and the maximum drawdown is 20 percent, you know where does this 20 percent come from? Maybe you impose it yourself. Maybe your spouse imposed it for you. Maybe your boss imposed it on you. Okay. So anyway, you decided that 20 percent is the maximum you can lose. Well, what we do is you can put 80 cents of your equity into the safe account. Okay, you won't touch it. You won't. You won't. Uh, uh, you know, withdraw from it. You might add to that safe account, but you will never withdraw it from the safe account. So you will always have 80 cents left at the end of the day, and then you put this 20 cents into your risky account that you are going to trade. Okay, so right right away you see that this setup will never allow you to have more than 20 percent drawdown because even if you lose all your money in the risky account you still have that 80 cents but that's not all if that's the case then you know we we are done but that's not all we will trade the risky account but we will apply the Kelly leverage to that account so if for example uh, Kelly leverage is five you will trade five times 0.2 which is you know one dollar so you will still trade them portfolio uh, with market value one dollar uh, in the risky account but the Kelly formula tells you that this risky account will never you know go to ruin it will never reach zero equity so that's that's great um, now what happens uh, after you trade one period after you trade one period if it is profitable you can rebalance the capital between the safe versus risky account by withdrawing money from the risky account and put it in a safe account. So let's say after one period, the equity in the risky account might be 25% of the total equity, right? Because you make money. So the weight in the risky account is suddenly higher. Well, we will then need to move cash out, withdraw cash from this risky account, put it into the safe account to restore the 20% uh, balance. You know, because remember, we said we will never want to have more than 20% drawdown, and maximum drawdown is always measured from the high water mark. It's not measured from the initial equity. So that's very important uh, notion to 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 be clarified. Maximum drawdown is not measured from the initial equity level. It's measured from the high water mark. So you have to keep moving your gains from your risky account to your safe account so that the maximum uh, drawdown from the high watermark will never be more than 20%. Okay, so that's the good scenario. That's when you make money. What if you lose money? If you lose money, don't do anything. What does don't do anything means? Don't do anything means don't withdraw money from, don't transfer money between the two accounts, but you still have to apply Kelly formula to the risky account, which means that next day your portfolio market value has to be reduced because you lost money in the risky account by applying the same Kelly leverage your portfolio market value will be reduced the next day okay uh, but of course that's the same case if you are uh, profitable so even if you're profitable you and after rebalancing you have a new uh, amount in your risky account you still even you, so you withdraw some money from the risky account the risky account equity still is higher than before so based on Kelly formula next day you will still trade a uh, a bigger uh, size portfolio okay so let me see uh, if that's uh, yes yeah. so this brings us to the next quiz question. But before I go on the quiz question, uh, let me pause to see if there's any confusion about this, uh, this methodology of CPPR. At the end of the day, when you're rebalancing the risky uh, portfolio, it, you're, it, it's only that portfolio is the only one that Kelly's applied to. The Kelly's not applied to the safe, right? So that it doesn't, you don't have to uh, change the dollar amounts that you're, you're risking on the safe portfolio. Is that correct? That is right. The the safe um, portfolio is just a bank account, so we, gotcha. we don't trade in it. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, okay, there are a few questions. Okay. Um, 
George says that the M and S in the Kelly formula are unlikely stationary parameters in reality. How effective is the Kelly formula in a non-stationary circumstance? Well, that, that is a uh, you know, very good question, and that is uh, another caveat uh, for Kelly formula. And that is that, um, in principle, we should use as long a historical um, period to estimate M and S as possible. Okay, so the, you know, obviously any strategy, if you just take a snapshot or take a short period of three months, you could be you know, making money. I've heard often that uh, some people's strategy never had a losing day in three months. Okay, so that's great. If you apply formula, uh, if you use that three months to compute your Kelly formula, you know, it might ask you to apply 50 times leverage to it. So that is not meaningful. So you should use as long a historical data set to estimate, uh, to, to, to get a good estimate of M and S as, as possible. However, the, sometimes the problem with financial markets is that there's the notion of regime shift. So, you know, if you are using data in the 1990s, it might be meaningless because in, that, in those days, the bid ask spread might be much wider. Uh, there may be, uh, you know, there, there, there's not, not all these easy ends. There are not as many uh, 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 quant traders out there. There are no high quincy trading. So if you had uh, used data from that long ago, uh, it will also be meaningless because the, the estimate for the M and S will not be realistic. The things have changed. So this become a rather subjective question. So you have to use, choose the data set long enough so that the statistics is meaningful, but do not too long that it include uh, a completely different market structure. So for example, for me, uh, I would insist on using data that is at least um, you know, since 2007 to estimate M and S, because that would incorporate certain uh, financial crisis, but using uh, data before 2007 uh, is not particularly useful because um, a lot of the high finance traders come into play around 2007, a lot of the market regu uh, you know, regulation change around 2007 and 2008, so it might not be relevant anymore. So it is true that uh, you know, M and S changes, but we are hoping that the long-term uh, estimate of M and S within the same regime will not change. So obviously, if you are only using one month to estimate M and S, it will change radically. But that's not advisable uh, for your estimation of Kelly. Gotcha. Uh, on the risky account, are we using half Kelly, or in the risky account, you can uh, use Kelly because even if you are, uh, you know, over levered, uh, the worst that can happen is to lose all your money in the risky account. Okay. You are still within your maximum drawdown. Okay. So I would be comfortable using the full can. Gotcha. And uh, uh, Mike asked the question, is using half Kelly based on anything in particular or could it just as easily be two-thirds or one-quarter? Is it calculated from something else? And also have traders using half Kelly been wiped out? Uh, well, the second question, I'm, I can't you know, I, I don't know all the traders in the world, so I don't know if they have to <laughs> wipe, wipe out. Uh, theoretically, of course, you can, you can still be wiped out. You know, for example, one day, if you invest all your money into one stock, okay, and that one stock has been behaving very well, and you are using a carry, half carry of two times leverage, and then that stock, like Enron, okay, right. suddenly just go to bankrupt, obviously you'll be wiped out. So I can't, certainly there are cases where if you are undiversified, it, could, right. it can happen. But if, if you have a diversified portfolio, then the whole point of Kelly is to prevent that. That's right. If you're trading futures, which is uh, you know much rather unlikely that you know good oil will suddenly go to from right, right. hundred dollars to zero uh, in one day. <laughs> All right. So, uh, but the first part of the question I don't quite understand. Uh, he's saying that you know you're using an example of half Kelly. If let's say that he's more risk averse or less risk averse, can he change that to a quarter Kelly or two thirds Kelly? Is that something that's you okay. know, adjustable? Well, you know, the, the, the half Kelly or one third Kelly, that becomes a sort of uh, arbitrary, right? I mean, obviously, if you are using one third Kelly, it's, more, it's safer than using half Kelly. But then the next guy come along and say, why don't you use one quarter Kelly? You know, obviously, <laughs> the lower the leverage you use, the less risk, but then you'll be farther and farther away 
fall from the optimal right. optimal goal. Gotcha. So that's that's the problem. Uh, a, a couple more questions. Uh, Andre asks uh, if you could start again. Would you still go for a job in the finance sector, or would you become a private trader from the beginning? Um, well, that's that's a, a, a <laughs> um, okay. So let, let me. I, I, it's hard to say, you know, but I, I, there's a, a one way I can answer it, which is that I haven't learned very much uh, working in the financial industry that is relevant to trading. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, yes, I, I I would guess that um, uh, you know it, it's that okay. But there's one positive aspect in working in financial industry is that it builds up your equity. Right. So if you have no <laughs> equity, you can't trade. So that's right. that's quite simple. Right. <laughs> but on the other hand, from the knowledge point of view, it doesn't help very much. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question. Uh, uh, Andres says, isn't both the half Kelly and the CPPI just subjective adjustments to Kelly? I think we just talked about this. Uh, meaning that any logical adjustments would be equally valid, uh, or maybe these two methods have something more concrete behind them. Okay, so um, the reason, the only reason why I introduced CPPI as a modification of Kelly formula is because in, in practice, Okay, if you are just one single guy, okay, trading your own account, nobody looking behind your, uh, you know, over your shoulder, forget about CPI. You can take a 90% drawdown. You know, no, nobody will bother you if you have a 90% drawdown. So you just adopt Kelly uh, with the goal of maximizing your equity. But if you have somebody looking over your shoulder, your spouse, your boss, your, you know, your co, uh, your manager of your of your trading group. And they tell you that if you're down more than 20%, your career is over, then you are forced right. to adopt okay. CPPI. Yes. Uh, and if the same is the same same person, if the if most of the standard deviation is on the positive side of the Gaussian return function, doesn't Kelly unfairly punish the strategy? Like for example, it will suggest a lower leverage than it should. Uh, yes. Yes, that is in fact true. Yes, if you have a, 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 a you know, positive skill and uh, you know kurtosis that uh, you know positive skill and a, a, a non-zero kurtosis, yes, Kelly will under uh, under lever. Uh, that is true. It's just like the mirror image of the case where, which is more normal, where the strategy had a fat tail in the negative end, then Kelly will right. over lever. Yes, correct. Uh, Okay, two two remaining questions, then we can move on. Uh, Jonas asks, how does one take into account the possibility of a flash crash in a leveraged account? That could, after all, lead to negative equity in the risky account. So he's talking about, like, like futures. I, I don't really know. I mean, I think that in the past there were certainly examples of negative equity, but I think that most modern – I assume it's possible – but most most of the time, most modern uh, brokers will simply close the position. They're not going to wait and issue a margin call. I guess it depends on your your account and your relationship and you know who you are. Um, so, do you have any comment on on that? Yes, this this is some somewhat get into the legal uh, you know territory. And 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 I actually I asked a similar question to uh, Ed Thorpe, uh, one one of the uh, you know the sort of uh, uh, luminaries in the. Uh, Exposition of California, and he said basically you should uh, trade through a LLC, so that uh, you. <laughs> right. So if it's negative, then you just walk away. That's right. Yes. Um, um, okay. Uh, go ahead. Arendim says, "How does Kelly change in very volatile environments, like, for example, during 2008?" Um, Yes, interestingly, I have done some Monte Carlo work and uh, using these uh, extreme data, and you know, and to my surprise, uh, for some of the test strategy that I fitted in, uh, it recommended leverage that is, uh, you know, you know, Kelly, assuming that everything is uh, uh, is uh, Gaussian, uh, recommended leverage that is not too dissimilar from a brute force uh, optimization of leverage. So yeah, it's actually fair pretty well. Um, but there's one thing is uh, that one should pay attention to, is, you know, is, is that if Kelly uh, recommend a leverage uh, uh, so high that uh, on a day when you're uh, when you think 
your price can move 20%. And your, oh, well, well let, let me make it very simple. If Kelly recommended a leverage of five, and you think that in one day, your portfolio could have dropped 20%, be perhaps because you are trading S&P 500 futures, and you know it did experience a 20% drop in one day. So if you leverage five times, obviously you'll be wiped out on that day. You don't need Kelly formula to tell you that. You know if you are right. leveraged <laughs> five times, you know, right. so, so you do have to apply certain common sense to it because uh, sure. you know we'll, that that's that's all I have to say. Okay, so let's uh, hold questions and go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, good, great. Uh, okay, so, so let me uh, say that the next slide is a quiz. Okay, so suppose you have a strategy trading just one stock, okay, and uh, this is a question about CPPI. So you start with a, a total equity of 100K, uh, and your maximum drawdown is 20%, so that's something that uh, is arbitrary. You decide that your maximum drawdown is 20%, and uh, Kelly leverage is 10, okay, it's, uh, you, you, you think you had a great strategy, so you had a Kelly average of 10. And your profit uh, after one day was $20,000. Okay, so what should be the order size for that stock the next day if you are practicing CPPI? Okay, uh, as the answers come in, I'm going to read them out. Uh, K-Star says 2.4K. Uh, uh, let me uh, let me clarify. Do you do you mean two point four k, or uh, you have some uh, digits after that? He's written only two point four. Okay. Um, right, just then, it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> JP says twenty five. Uh, Rhino says, "Oh, that's unrelative." Kevin says six hundred. Uh, a different Kevin says twenty thousand. BP says two hundred and forty k. Correct. Okay, yeah. so uh, BP, I need your BMT username, and then Ernie, you can explain. Okay, so um, you know, after one day, you know, after making this twenty k profit, the new equity is one hundred twenty k. Now, one hundred twenty k is the total equity including both the risky account and the safe account, okay. So we said that the maximum drawdown is 20%, so the risky account uh, should have 20% of this new equity. So 20% of 120K, let's pull out our calculator, uh, 120 times 0.2, that is 24K. So the new risky account um, equity should be 24K. And remember, uh, our Kelly leverage is 10, so you you, you, you should leverage this 24K equity 10 times to give you a 240K uh, right. portfolio or more order size because the portfolio has only one stock, so the order size is 240K. So congratulations, uh, BP, on um, winning a book. We still have three more books to give away. And I want to go back to Peter's question before we move on too far. Uh, Peter says, I'm using Kelly in a different way for trade selection, for example, He's using 12 possible strategies on multiple baskets of instruments like the NASDAQ 100 or the SP 100. And so overall, the strategies are back-tested and profitable. And when it triggers the possible trades of the day, he will select the trades with the highest Kelly factor. So he will only trade the best historical odds. Um, this keeps him from uh, keeps him inside the capacity constraints when too many trade ideas are triggered. Do you agree with that? Uh, it's a rather complicated scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know that I have all the moving parts figured out uh, in okay. my brain. So, yeah. So that's you, one of those things you, that, that Peter yeah. maybe can email you later and get your comment on. That's right. Yes, please email me. Yep. Okay, so uh, no other questions. Does anybody have any other questions on this uh, slide about how we reached 240K? Okay. All right, I don't see anything else, so let's move on. Okay, great. So, um, so this slide is uh, sort of just emphasizing what I have been talking all along. You know, the Kelly leverage uh, that, uh, you know, M divided by S squared, that is optimal only 
this simple formula is optimal only when the returns are Gaussian. Uh, and uh, if you assume a non-Gaussian distribution or, you know, that then the formula won't be so simple, although you can still do a brute force optimization of the leverage. So the question is, um, you know, as I said, how close is this uh, simple formula to uh, the actual optimal when you do this brute force op optimization? And what I find out is that actually the answer is pretty close. So that's what I've been emphasizing. Uh, the simplicity of this formula, it's, um, uh, that does not really diminish the uh, uh, the closeness of the approximation. You know, a simple formula is actually give you an answer pretty close to a brute force method uh, and all, all other complicated methods. So that's the beauty of this formula. Uh, okay, so now finally we move on to capital allocation. You know, there's some uh, some of you have asked earlier if you have multiple strategies that they are correlated, their returns are correlated, how do you uh, allocate uh, leverage to the different strategy? And here's the formula, F equals C inverse C M. So this is a, um, a matrix equation because F is become a factor because now you have multiple uh, strategies, 1 to N, so F1, F2 and Fn are the optimal leverage for each strategy or each portfolio. Uh, the T simply means the uh, transpose, matrix transpose is not important. C, this is the covariance matrix of the returns. Okay, and uh, you know, you can compute it using even Excel, uh, but usually MATLAB is the easiest uh, platform I use to compute the covariance matrix of the return. So you have to compare every pair of returns, you know, how, how often does the uh, uh, strategy one uh, have the same positive return as strategy two and strategy three and how often the strategy two has the same return as strategy three, that sort of uh, numbers. So it's a matrix and then M is also a factor, capital M is also a factor, but that is the, uh, the, uh, the vector of a average access return of each strategy. So if you just compute this Covariance matrix takes the inverse and multiply it on this, uh, apply it to the factor M, you get the optimal um, leverage on each separate strategy. Okay, that's assuming that you want to use Cali formula to run capital allocation uh, and you do not have your own ca uh, capital allocation based on your own strategy. Uh, so this formula not actually not only tells you what the relative market value is, but it also tells you what the overall leverage is. Because the, what is the overall leverage? The overall leverage is simply the sum of the absolute value of the individual leverage. Okay, that's the overall leverage of the combined strategy. So some of this leverage might be negative, meaning that you should be shorting the portfolio, or maybe you should run the opposite of strategy. So you have to take those. Uh, the absolute values of these numbers before you sum them and that give you the, the overall average. Now, so here's an example. Um, you know, I, I, you can construct a portfolio of three ETFs. Um, one is OIH, it's an oil service sector ETF. RKH is a regional bank ETF. RTH is a retail ETF. And, uh, and that's actually an example in my book. If you look at the, um, uh, in my book on the chapter on uh, money and risk management, you will find this example. If you run this um, methodology, the, the, the matrix equation that I wrote on data between 2000 and 2007, uh, you would find that the optimal average is 1.29, 1.17, minus 1.5. The minus sign, again, means that you should be shorting the RTH ETF. Okay. Uh, so I didn't, uh, you know, go into the, uh, the nitty-gritty arithmetic details or the mathematical details of how to, actually how to do the cal major calculation, but I, you know, it's something that you can do quite easily in MATLAB. So let me, before I go on, let me see if there's any question on this uh, capital allocation formula. Uh, Arindam says if you have a strategy, th uh, I'm not sure I understand. If you have a strategy three out of strategies one, two, and three, with strategy three F equals negative one, do you just run that strategy? Do you just not run that strategy? Uh, okay, so 
okay, so I, 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 let me interpret the question. So right now we have this negative 1.5 for the strategy. So is the question whether you should just drop the RTH? You know, let's say RTH is a name for a strategy, not an ETF. So you can't really short a strategy sometimes. Yes. Uh, so should you just uh, drop it? That, that is uh, his question. But I, the yes. way I understood, you said just to go short instead of not running it at all. Well, you can, uh, yes. Okay. You can go short the ETF, but to go short a strategy, is, there's a problem. Because oftentimes the, the strategy is negative uh, because of transaction cost. So just by shorting a strategy, you don't get, you know, so the strategy after transaction cost gotcha. give you minus 1.5. But right. you want the opposite strategy is not going to give you plus 1.5. Right. Transaction cost must still give you the same. So that's a right. problem. Okay. So what I would recommend is if you find a carry um, allocation uh, for a strategy to be negative, indeed drop it, but you have to rerun the uh, capital allocation formula for the remaining two strategies to find a new optimal uh, ratio. Okay, so the old ratio no longer applies when you only have two strategies left. Okay. Uh, it doesn't, so doesn't seem so. <laughs> doesn't look like it, so we can move forward. Okay. So, uh, all right, so one final uh, sort of uh, caveat, let, let me say, uh, about uh, using Cali for capital allocation is that covariance estimation is often inaccurate. And it's inaccurate because a lot of times it, when you apply this to uh, strategies, not portfolio, one strategy may not be trading uh, many days. So you would get zero return. So a lot of days you would have zero return on one strategy and not zero return on another one. So there are rarely situations where you have, you know, maybe it's not often that both strategies have returned. So the covariance estimation can be very bad because uh, you, you hardly can estimate covariance when both, uh, you know, uh, the two strategies do not simultaneously trade and do not simultaneously have non zero return. So oftentimes, uh, you might simplify it by just sticking in one zero or minus one into this covariance. Uh, matrix, depending on whether the two strategies you think are very closely related, uh, you may be they're just variations of the same strategy, or whether they're opposite. You know, one is a momentum strategy, one is a mean volume strategy, so if one is positive, you think the, uh, the other one is, must be negative. So you might just arbitrarily assign one zero minus one to the covariance matrix. They might give you a better answer than to just rely on back test where some of these strategies may not have simultaneous return on the same day. And the second caveat is something I mentioned before in, con uh, you know, in reaction to one of the questions. If your bookish margin limit is much lower than optimal F, or if you are capacity limited, you'll find that it might be optimal to get rid of this cap uh, capital allocation and just put all your eggs into one basket and just invest in the strategy with the highest average return. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are interested in more details on Cali formula and the application, you can go to this website by Edward Thorpe. Um, you know, he, he has a much more mathematical exposition, exposition of all these issues I talk about. Uh, okay, uh, I don't think there is much to comment on this slide, so let me just move on to the next one. Uh, limitations, okay, so I, I emphasize Gaussian assumption is one big limitation. It can underestimate probability of large loss. So in many cases, you can use Kelly formula only as a upper bound on your leverage. So if Kelly says that 5 is the, is the optimal leverage, make sure that you don't exceed 5. But you can certainly use 2.5 or use 2 if you're you know, nervous. But it basically tells you that you should not go above 5. So you can regard it as an upper bound rather than what uh, rather than the the actual number you should use. Uh, and despite the fact that Gaussian assumption might be wrong, capital allocation might still be valuable because uh, 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 you just have to make sure that your overall average is smaller than what the Kelly formula tells you, but you can still use Kelly formula to allocate leverage amongst the different strategies. Now there's one more caveat about Kelly formula is that it is a, a situation where if everybody manages risk according to Kelly formula, it can actually lead to a contagion. And that actually happened in 2007, where uh, in 2007 there are a lot of funds which are hybrid funds. They have a, a mortgage-backed security 
portfolio and they have a set up portfolio. And they lost a lot of money on the mortgage portfolio. So by because of Kelly formula, they are forced to sell into the loss to reduce uh, you know to reduce their portfolio size in order to maintain the same leverage. But their mortgage backed security portfolio is very illiquid. So they instead they cut back on the set up portfolio. And because one fund is cutting back on set up portfolio, it depresses the prices of the long stock and it raises the price of the short stock. It costs another hedge fund which has a similar set up portfolio. You know, a lot of these set up portfolio have a high correlation. They all long the same stocks and they all short the same stocks. So if you are somebody is liquidating the set up, set up portfolio, it will cause losses in somebody else's set up portfolio that holds similar stock. And because of Kelly formula, they will have to reduce the size too. So everybody, in, in other words, are selling at the same time for the same stocks because of this risk management scheme. And that can lead to contagion. And that is actually what happened in the summer of 2007, where many of the big startup fund loses. Uh, so if you, if you, Ernie, if you look at like AIG, for example, yes. okay, would you say that, that their whole problem was simply lack of diversification? I mean, the reason that they failed and required a bailout is because they, like you just said, this contagion and it depressed the prices. And you know everyone was coming to them. Is it they they had too much of their eggs in one basket for uh, you know the insurance payouts? Is that do you, is that a, a good explanation? They were over leveraged in that industry. Well, uh, AIG certainly is over leveraged, but um, th their problem is a little bit different from these startup funds because they actually hold uh, you know mortgage backed securities and they are short options essentially, right? They are insurance, so they are writing, op writing options, so that's a very risky decision. And the reason they collapse is, you know, A, because they're writing options, B, because they are over leveraged, and C, uh, you know, because it's not diversified. But right. for this, uh, for this startup funds, they, the reason they had a big drawdown is not because they are over leveraged, and it's not because they are undiversified. Uh, and it is purely because uh, they are all holding similar positions as each other. And so whenever one fund loses money and liquidate right. portfolio, everybody had to liquidate. But I, but I mean in terms of AIG requiring government assistance to keep the doors open, you know, they, they could have as many risky, they, they could have as much risk as they wanted on the mortgage-backed securities as long as it was only a certain percentage of their overall business portfolio, right? And it still wouldn't have bankrupted the company. So in my, right, yes. in my eyes, it was simply a, I would classify it as lack of diversification. They put too much risk on this side of their portfolio, which caused everything else in their business to, you know, not be able to uh, uh, be enough to, you know, keep the doors open. Yes, I mean, you could, the same thing is true for an individual trader. You know, if you love Apple and 80% of your portfolio is Apple, or maybe it's made up of Apple suppliers, you know, like Foxconn or something, and something happens to Apple, um, that's, that's just simply lack of diversification on, on your part that would cause, you know, substantial losses. But that's right, and that is actually, um, you know, related to our earlier discussion about uh, where the Kelly formula uh, is it's a good estimate. You know, if you have an undiversified portfolio, it's not going to be a good estimate right. because the tail risk is simply too much, right? right. So, so that, that makes it quite right. useless to actually apply California. And, and the same thing we talked about earlier on correlation, too, being an important factor. Okay, so uh, Andre asks the question, in describing a business case for quant trading, uh, you mentioned in your book that someone with alternative skills should ponder whether quant trading is the right path. What skills do you find most useful for a quant trader, and what alternative skills uh, in your mind would switch someone out from quant trading? Well, you know, quant trading is not all that different uh, from other type of trading, you know, discretionary trading. You know, both of them, the, the, the essence of success is that you have to understand the market. You have to have a, a fundamental understanding of the market. You know, just because you are a good programmer 
or a good mathematician will not make you profitable. Okay, that, that's I, that's I, I've found I've, I've learned the hard way. So <laughs> the prerequisite of being a good quant trader is the same prerequisite of being a good discretionary trader. But the difference between a good quant trader, quant trader and discretionary trader is that the quant trader will have the programming skills to turn their intuition and knowledge into a program so that uh, it eliminates emotions, it eliminates mistakes from ongoing operation of that trading strategy. So it's become a more disciplined uh, uh, sort of a trading uh, methodology than uh, you know, discretion. So I, I think uh, so the additional skills beyond what a discretionary trader needs is obviously just uh, you know being a food programmer. The mm -hmm. math required is very minimal. You know I think that anyone who have finished one uh, freshman year of college in uh, statistics and uh, linear algebra could tackle any sort of uh, quant trading strategy pretty well unless you are into derivatives. But uh, you know, for cash equities or for uh, futures, uh, there's no advanced math that's needed. Uh, so you know, programming is much more important uh, for that for that transition. Right. Okay. I, I don't see any of the questions, so I think we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so actually my formal uh, uh, sort of uh, presentation is over, and I have three more quiz questions okay, uh, great. coming up. Awesome. Uh, so the question three, we are long one stock, okay, let's say we are long a stock in our account, and let's say the Kelly leverage of this uh, stock is 0.9, okay, so it, this is, uh, remember, it's less than one, it's, it, it, you know, it tells you to, to be conservative. One, after one day, the stock price dropped. The question is, should we buy more shares the next day or should we sell some shares according to California? Uh, okay. A good way to tackle this is to construct a numerical example for yourself. Uh, K star says sell. And uh, Kevin also says sell. Sonata says drop. Andre says sell. And Stacy says buy. Okay, that's great. Right. <laughs> okay, so let me explain. Uh, let's uh, do an example. Let's say your your initial equity is ten thousand dollars. Okay, ten k, and your stock market value based on the K leverage is 0 0.9 times ten, so that's nine k. So the stock market value is nine k, which is less than your initial equity. Rather unusual, but that's what the, the example says. Now you lose one thousand dollars, lose one k. So the new equity. Uh, is uh, is what the new equity is 9k, right? Because your initial equity is 10k, so you lose 1k. The new equity is 9k. What is the new target market value? The new target market value is 0.9 times this 9k of equity. That is 8.1k. Okay, so the new target market value is 8.1k. But remember, the actual market value was 9. So uh, I'm I'm sorry. The 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 actual market value is 8 because initially the stock market value is 9k. We lost 1k, so the actual market value is 8k. So the new target market value is actually higher than the actual market value. So you need to buy some stocks in order to get up to 8.1k. So this is an unusual case because the Kelly leverage is less than 1. So you only want to sell into a loss when the Kelly leverage is greater than 1. If Kelly leverage is actually less than 1, you actually do the opposite. If you lose okay. money, you actually have to buy more stocks. Okay, great. So thanks. Uh, uh, congratulations, Stacy. So we still have two more books after this. And I, I have one question from the presentation before we do more quiz questions, Ernie. Um, okay. Erendim asks, what if you have a low vol environment strategy, so low volatility environment strategy? Uh, well, I don't know if he means low volume or low volatility. Uh, and the other is a momentum strategy that does well in a high volatility environment. Okay, so currently in a low volatility environment, because of recent history, uh, the strategy Kelly will give more leverage to the low volatility performing strategy. However, regime change studies show that low volatility is followed up by high volatility environments. So as a trader, you might want to allocate more to a high volatility strategy. Is that analysis correct? I hope you followed that. <laughs> well, I, I think I, I, you know, I follow the overall gist of it. I think the the thing to remember is that um, m divided by s squared. Okay, that gives us the Kelly leverage. What is m? M you can estimate it using history. 
but that is seldom right. If you think that you have an insight, that for example, you think that uh, volatility is mean reverting, and because you know uh, you currently you are uh, you, you are expecting a high vol regime going forward, well, your estimate of M can be higher. So that becomes a bit arbitrary because uh, if you think that you can make a better uh, estimate of the expected return than just using historical averages, go ahead. You know, use that your proprietary estimate and stick that into the Kelly formula. So it, naturally, if you have a higher expected return for that strategy, you will uh, f you know come up with a higher Kelly leverage. So it's all a matter of what your expected return and what your expected variance of return will be. Uh, you, you might have a very sophisticated method of estimating that much better than just simply using historical averages. Okay. All okay. right, so I don't see any other questions, so you have another quiz question for us? Yes. Uh, question four. If you have a portfolio of three stocks and uh, you have uncorrelated returns, all of them have the same expected returns. What are the statistical uh, attributes of these stocks uh, that will determine their relative allocations? Okay, so remember you have a portfolio of three stocks. They are uncorrelated and they have the same expected returns. Uh, Is this a... What other what other attribute will determine okay. their relative allocation? Uh, Andres uh, uh, says standard deviation. That is uh, correct. All right. <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, I know we have multiple Andres in the room, so uh, I'm going to send you a yep. private message there so you know which one it is. And I need your BMT username, please. Okay. So anyone have questions on uh, how we came to that answer? Uh, Jonas says, no, it's the variance, no, it's the variance of, of S uh, to the second. Uh, that is true, but, um, uh, well, variance and, and, the uh, and standard deviation are, you know, related by, right. as you said, the square, so. <laughs> He's, he says, yeah, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, all right, so congratulations, Andres. Uh, we still have, what, one more book, so let's go to the next slide. Okay. If you're trading just one stock, what's the benefits of maintaining Kelly leverage? There are multiple answers. Just give me one benefit. Okay. Um, Andrew, a different Andrew, says uh, maximize profits. Uh, Lucia says no risk of ruin. Okay. I think I like the second answer uh, better. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, Lucia, I need your BMT username, please. Uh, to maximize profit is a bit iffy because I would prefer to you to say to maximize the long term growth rate because uh, you know. Okay, uh, I thought that I figured that was going to be you. All right, I was I'm talking to to Lucia. I, I was hoping he was in the webinar today. All right, so um, uh, does anybody have any other questions that we did not already answer? Uh, and Ernie, uh, do you have like a contact slide or any other slides that you want to show us today? Yes, uh, you know, like I said, uh, if you have any questions, do feel free to email me, uh, or you can comment. You know, go to my blog. There are lots of comments. There are a lot of user-generated co content on that blog uh, from different traders. So feel free to post your question on the comments uh, of the relevant the relevant blog posts. I monitor all my blog posts in the past few years. So feel free to comment on something that I wrote uh, three years ago, and uh, you can go to my my main website, ebchen.com. Uh, has some information, but um, don't, there there's a premium content section that is for people who has my book. They have the password to log into, but otherwise, uh, you can go to my blog. Okay. And uh, you know, so uh, enjoy my book if you have uh, <laughs> read it. <laughs> okay, so we have several questions. Um, Andres asks, uh, Ernie, in your experience, do you suggest for a retail trader to use Kelly or half Kelly? Half, half Kelly for sure, yes. Right, okay. Uh, unless you're using CPPI, in which case you can apply full Kelly to the risky account. Okay. Uh, Sanat asks, can you tell us more about the second book, what the topic is, or any details? The second book has uh, covered a lot more on futures strategies. Um, okay. 
yeah, and it's you know basically had a, a little bit more higher map, you know require a little bit more math. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, uh, Ernie, I'll go ahead and officially ask you to come back maybe in June for our uh, four year anniversary. Maybe that'll coincide roughly with the release of the book, and we can give away some books. Okay, great. Um, Andre asks, what do you think about the top finance-oriented MBA programs out there? Do you think they could prepare someone better for a successful quant trader path? Well, from what I understand, a lot of the um, uh, finance uh, MBA programs are focused on derivatives pricing. Uh, they use a very complicated mathematics, and um, most of which are not particularly useful for uh, you know, cash equity trading. But um, I do see, for example, that Columbia University has a uh, substantial setup. I, I, I like the stuff that come out from, from the seminar. So a lot of the professors produce good stuff. So, uh, you know, Columbia is a good choice. Uh, I, but I'm not familiar with the program at other schools uh, simply because I've never attended their seminars. I'm not saying they're bad. <laughs> I, I can only say that I like to come. Uh, the seminar from Columbia, and I think they have a very decent uh, finance MBA program. Okay, uh, and Lucia is commenting that he, he wants to add to Andre's question that MIT has a strong buy side quant program nowadays. Okay, uh, Ryan asks, um, do you do any kind of private consulting? Like, if he wants you to write um, scripts, I don't know if he's talking about MATLAB or or whatnot. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. You can send the email me. Okay. Uh, George says, since the retail traders are more nimble than the institutional traders, do you think that the retail traders should trade differently than institutional traders? Yes, there are a lot of niche opportunities that uh, have very low capacity, and the institutional traders won't be interested in them, and right. those are areas that retail traders can benefit. Right. Uh, Lucia asks, since the returns are not a Weiner process, hope I said that correctly, your Kelly average is going to be unstable with respect to the sampling interval of your mean standard, devi standard deviation. The uh, numerical differences are significant if your holding periods are short. It distorts your uh, VAR as well. Would you sample your returns daily? And also, do you prefer to sample realized or unrealized returns? I, uh, okay, so yes, I sample it daily, but like I said, uh, if your uh, Kelly leverage is high, you have to sample uh, more frequently. Okay, that, and um, certainly I use the um, un, the total return, or you know, for for my estimation, both realized and the unrealized part. Okay. Uh, Jonas says, when using multiple strategies, the drawdown of one will influence the growth rate of the others on the same account. Does it make sense to split the accounts, like one for each strategy? Uh, yes, that is a judgment call. What I have found is that uh, you, you, you do want to separate the Stephen strategy sometimes. You don't want the best strategy, the good strategy, to subsidize the best strategies. You, if the best strategies keep losing and reach maximum drawdown, you should just shut it down rather than keep uh, moving money from the good strategy to subsidize it. So I, I actually prefer having different accounts for the different strategies. Okay. Uh, Andre says, it's kind of unrelated to Kelly, but what would Ernie suggest to a beginner quant trader to focus on? Is it to build knowledge towards becoming, oh, I'm sorry, uh, what would you suggest to focus on to build knowledge towards becoming a trader? Well, you know, one should always read about, uh, you know, books, blogs, and all kinds of stuff, and at the same time, uh, tries to backtest simple strategies. You know, there's no harm to backtest a strategy and paper trade it, and if it doesn't work, figure out why it doesn't work. You know, why is the reality so different from the backtest? You know, once you figure that out, you will fastly improve your uh, intuition about what a good strategy is. So let's talk about backtesting for just a second, Ernie. Do you use MATLAB predominantly or TradeStation or some other platform? Yes, I do use MATLAB predominantly, but that's just me. Uh, you know, I'm familiar with MATLAB, so if you are familiar with trade stations, by all means, use uh, trade station. Okay. Um, uh, Peter's asking regarding quiz question three: the Kelly leverage is less than one. Is that still a positive expectation? 
Oh yes, uh, it just said that uh, it just happened that the variance might be very large, you know, compared with the mean. So that makes it uh, less than one. Okay. But it, it's still positive. Yeah. Andre asks, uh, were you always successful within your private trader history or did you also have some bad years? Uh, and can you tell us what kind of mistakes that you made? Well, I had uh, the, uh, the first year I became an independent trader, I had a losing year uh, due to one strategy, one pair to be precise, and that is the uh, XLE crude oil pair. That I, and I lose money in that because I didn't understand the notion of role return in futures. I can go on all day about that, so <laughs> um, let me not do that. Uh, but after that, I, the, my total return, you know, the return, cons, uh, including my private trading plus my fund plus uh, managed accounts and so forth, they all uh, have been positive uh, since that year. Okay. Uh, Lisa asks, uh, he's noticed that you spent some time with uh, hidden Markov models. If there's no conflict of interest with your clients, can you tell us if the approach is promising? Well, to be frank, I have uh, indeed I have tried a lot of times on uh, you know trying to f see if it's useful in finance, and I have never succeeded in making it work. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, George says, if past performance does not indicate future profits, how useful is backtesting? That's always a, a common question. Yes, uh, and I think there's a good answer from one of the commenters on my blog, and that is that it it can reject a strategy. Uh, it may not be, you know, if your back test is good, it may not mean that the live trading is good, but if the back test is bad, you can forget about the strategy. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, and I find personally that it also gives you, it sets forward some expectations, right? So if you start live trading or paper trading this strategy and you're way outside the boundaries of what it was doing in a back test, that's a pretty good idea that it's not going to conform to, you know, your overall profit goals. Right. Um, okay, so George, or we just did that one, Lucia uh, saying, also regarding curve fitting, one of your favorite recommendations is to reduce the degrees of freedom and the parameterization of the strategy. Could you suggest some other more advanced means? Um, so he's saying that, you know, instead of, to, to get rid or lessen curve fitting, is there any other means other than reducing parameterization? Uh, well, you know, there are uh, ways such as uh, what they call it, the um, cross validation. You know, you pick different samples out of, uh, of the data and then you want to make sure that uh, the, the parameter is optimal in every subset of that data. So that one way to uh, make sure that it's not overfit. But in general, I, I have not found uh, this kind of optimization, no matter what precaution you take to be, to, to, to really fully avoid this problem of curve fit. Are you talking about like an out of sample, like a walk forward test? Yes, you could, uh, one way is to walk forward test, but walk forward test doesn't help you to determine the uh, parameter to the optimal parameter, you know, you, you, you have to determine the optimal parameter in the First, past. Right. But the thing is that uh, you can subdivide your past into different subsets to make sure that okay, the optimal gotcha. parameter is optimal in every subset. Gotcha. Excuse me, or more, more subsets. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I don't see any other questions, so I think that uh, at this time, uh, I want to thank Ernie for a really fantastic presentation. I'm sure that a lot of people uh, we'll be watching this in the future and to great benefit. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, they can contact Ernie through his email address. You see it right there on the screen. Uh, he also has his website and his blog right there. And be sure to check out his book on Amazon's quantitative trading if you weren't one of the five lucky people today to win one. And uh, to those guys, I will be sending you a private message uh, later today, and I'll get the info and we'll get those books in your hands. So um, I'll post the recording for this webinar sometime tomorrow on BMT in the usual spot. Um, I will send it to Ernie as well, so uh, he can send it out to his guys if he wants. Um, so thanks, Ernie. I really appreciate it, and I, I hope to have you back in June, perhaps, for our four-year anniversary. Maybe that will uh, coincide with your second book. That's great. Okay, thank you all for attending. Uh, have all a right. great evening. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ernie. The organizer has